Hey everyone, thanks for joining. Today I'm speaking with Maud Marin. Maud is an independent uh, candidate for city council in New York City. She was also a public defender and she'd gotten into trouble with the new anti-racism. And so uh, she's written a couple of op-eds and there was an article in Barry Weiss's Substack that Barry had written about um, what had happened with Maud. So I was hoping to get her on. Hi Maud, thank you for coming on. Hey, Obed, it's really nice to be here. Yeah, thanks again. And like I said, I mentioned the the article in Barry Weiss's Substack, but uh, you'd written a couple others. Um, if you wouldn't mind just going through a little bit of the background of like, like I said, how you fell afoul of the current anti-racism. Sure. Um, yeah. Well, what 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 Barry Weiss wrote about on her Substack, and then I wound up um, talking to her about on her podcast was. Um, the fallout from an, an op-ed I wrote. It was actually the third op-ed I had written about education issues in, in New York City where I'm located. I'm a mom of four kids who are um, New York City public school kids. And I'd been elected to my school board and I had um, been participating, speaking up about, basically about educational malfeasance in, in New York City, but really the issues of the day, right? Which is, um, the most broad category, I guess, would be to say equity, right? New York City uh, policy under our current mayor, they were constantly promoting equity, but their idea of equity somehow, what it translated into was getting rid of rigorous math classes, getting rid of honors programs, getting rid of gifted and talented programs. Um, and as parents were pushing back against that, what you would bump up against was what you just referred to as anti-racism. Um, which the first time anyone hears it, you think, oh, that sounds like something good. <laughs> that sounds yeah. like something I'd be down with, right? Yeah. Um, but it's it's a it's a funny named thing because it's actually in and of itself a very racist ideology because it sort of assigns characteristics to people based on skin color. Um, the most famous proponent, actually, I think I just read that Ibram Kendi got a, a MacArthur Genius Grant. So. Um, <laughs> The branding works, right? You call yourself an anti-racist and even if you promote policies that are in fact extremely racist and I think constantly assigning characteristics to people based on, you know, the social construct of race and based on the reality of, of people being treated differently by skin color historically. I mean, that's true. There's real racism in the world in, in my country or nearby in Canada. Um, but the, the way in which anti-racism was being implemented in our schools had really negative and disastrous educational, continues to have really negative and disastrous educational consequences for um, public school kids in my city and elsewhere. I mean, I don't live elsewhere, I don't, but I see it and I hear it from parents elsewhere. But what I knew about and what I wrote about was what was going on in New York City public schools. Okay, so when you mentioned like what was going on um, and you're saying you're on, you're on the board, so just out of curiosity, I mean, I've spoken to a few people about this, but how, like, if you were to go to a board meeting, like how many people were proponents of this stuff? And then the other side, like how many were kind of cowed into silence? Well, the funny thing is in, in so we have a lot of different school boards because New York City is such no. a large school system, right? It was at some point over a million kids. And I sat on a board in Manhattan, but it was only, there's even Manhattan, um, is divided up into six different zones, if districts we call it, school districts. And, um, you know, I said on my, my, the, the school district number two, um, community education council number two, and we would hold meetings where sometimes 10 people would show up, sometimes five people would show up, sometimes 20 people would show up, depending on your hot button issues. And then, um, we, when the mayor, uh, he's still our mayor right now in New York City, Bill de Blasio proposed this plan to get rid of an entrance exam to specialized high schools. We, that meeting, we had close to 400 parents showing up for that meeting because parents were really outraged because this was another example of trying to take away programs and schools that work in the name of equity and in the name of making things um, racially balanced in terms of, you know, the kids that are walking through the door, as opposed to fixing the underlying educational crisis that makes so many kids unable to do well on entrance exams. So that galvanized parents, right? And it got parents and it sort of brought these issues to a head. 
what I, what I had started to learn and realize is these underlying philosophies that were prompting these bad policy proposals, that's what we had to talk about. And that was what, you know, otherwise it's like banging your head against the wall. Otherwise we're gonna keep having the same conversation. So I wrote this op-ed talking about a training I had been in. Um, and, uh, you know, I wrote the truth of what I experienced and what I saw and lots of people agreed with me, lots of people disagreed with me. And my employer, uh, my union and my employer wrote public letters um, denouncing me and saying that basically I couldn't continue to do my job because of the, my opinions and ideas and the thoughts that I held. Um, I was honestly, I was then and still am now rather shocked by it, right? Because it was, because I'm a lawyer. And so this was an office of lawyers saying, just disregarding all sorts of basic constitutional principles and saying like, oh no, because you're white, you have to think like this about these issues. You have this obligation to think a certain way and to say certain words and to behave in a certain way. Otherwise you can't do your job. And that's, we, we, we know that's not true, right? People of different yeah. opinions can do their job well. But yeah, I mean, that's the thing. Like it's, you know, you said because you're white, you have to think this way, but it's, yeah. Th I mean, there's a lot of onus on white people. Like, I mean, especially like if you, what, whatever you want to call this stuff. Like I, I, I hate getting into arguments about the name. Like I just use critical race theory as a mm -hmm. catch all, but you know, white people are always guilty, blah, 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 blah. Like a whole lot of nonsense. But like for someone in my case, if I don't say what I'm supposed to say as, you know, quote unquote, person of color, then I have wrong think. And then, you know, I'm acting white or I'm speaking white, or it's just like, you know, for a side that places so much importance on lived experience, if you have the wrong lived experience, it doesn't <laughs> matter. I mean, it, yeah. it's, it's like, there's so much hypocrisy with this stuff. I, <clears throat> like one thing I'm just kind of curious about now because I, I started following this stuff, like really paying attention to the education, like around 2018, you know, then I come across articles about places like the Dalton school or the Fieldstone Academy right. and things like that. And this was back in like 2014 and 15. And I'm like, okay, so was at that point or were at that point, like the parents of public school kids just too busy to pay attention to what was going on. And then when COVID hit, and it was at home learning is that when things kind of clicked of like, Hey, wait a minute, something's not quite right. Because I mean, so this is not something that just happened. I know like right. after George Floyd, it just grew exponentially, but mm -hmm. especially in places like New York, it's been around for a while. Yeah. I think there are a couple of different threads that came together. And um, one is it had been brewing for a long time, but for parents, you have a lot on your plate, right? We're, taking care of your day job, taking care yeah. of your kids, taking care of your parents, like getting through life. Mm -hmm. And unless it's really, you know, pushing through the door of your, your kids experience, sometimes parents don't, it's hard to pay attention to the inner workings of your kid, you know, your, what's going on in your kid's school, COVID and switching to zoom certainly like opened a door, exposed a lot of classroom practices to parents. But, but at the same time, I think, um, folks who had been, you use the term critical race theory, I agree, to, people can get tripped up on terms, but I think it's a good overarching term to, mm -hmm. under, to, to sort of describe the idea of education being sort of a social justice platform, more, right? Like it's almost makes, makes education secondary to the idea of teaching kids like um, a sort of social justice skill set. And um, we saw it for some reason come to a head in Boston, in Virginia, in New York, in San Francisco. So it wasn't a locally specific thing in many ways because there were in New York City, um, I mean, in, um, in the United States, we saw what was happening in New York City, we saw happening in other cities where there was this effort to, to dismantle the most high performing schools in a system rather than to fix and to address um, the most low performing schools. And the idea was that was constantly promoted was the idea of racial equity. That if you changed 
the admission systems and change the number of kids that were walking through the door based on race as opposed to based on preparedness and their ability to do the work and to be well prepared for the, the rigors of the coursework, then that somehow you'd solve all the problems. You'd solve whatever problems you were trying to solve with regard to um, the racial composition of the classes and somehow the education would magically work out, which is not really how, how it works. Um, yeah. But we saw it everywhere. So I think it, it, I don't, I think COVID was it accelerated some parent involvement, but really this is something that had been brewing for a long time. And, um, and it was, it, it's been happening in cities. You read about it, you know, not just in our big cities, but all over the place where schools are trying to dismantle successful programs. Okay. And that's one thing I don't get, like you, know, you mentioned issues in education. So, I mean, whatever the statistics I see, it's something like 65% of kids graduate not being able to read at grade level. You know, I think it's higher in maths. So, you know, there's like a higher percentage of kids who can't do math at grade level. And it's just like, all right, okay, whether or not I agree with the curriculum they want to push, but if kids can't, if kids can't read and write, how the hell are they supposed to read you know, anti-racist baby. Like how are they, <laughs> like, like, like that, that's, I, know. I, I mean, it's kind of counterintuitive to what they want. I don't want anyone wanted. reading anti-racist baby, but I want them to be able to read anti-racist baby. <laughs> yeah. I mean, th there's a the thing, like, I mean, if you want them to be, you know, activists, which is like something we get into later, but it's like wanting kids to be activists, but if they're, if they can't function normally, like how are they supposed to be effective at their activism? Like I, that's, right where they really lose me here. I'm like, I might disagree with your goals, but your, your methods are completely contradictory to what your right. goals you know, seem to say. You know, but around that one, I'll just say, I've been, I've been thinking about it a lot because my kids just went back to school. And so we're having a lot of the um, back to school PTAs, mm -hmm. back to meeting, first PTA meeting of the year, back to school curriculum night. And there's all this talk and there's an endless stream of stuff about social justice and activism and how to be a world citizen and all this. And so, most of it, as I'm getting it from my kids' schools, sounds kind of nice. And it's, it's wrapped up at this point very pleasantly. Um, but at the end of the day for me, and I, and I actually, my kids are in schools that I, that I think are, are very good schools and I respect the administrators and the principals and the teachers there and I like them. So I don't say that it's not, this is not a personal attack but, uh, but at the end of the day, it's a little bit arrogant. It's like, it's not your job to, to, to you know, if a parent has, your job is to teach kids how to read, your job is to teach kids to be, you know, how to be competent in the grade level material so that they can go on to the next grade prepared. Um, but like, if you're a parent, if you're, if you are religious and you take your kids to church or you take your kids to a mosque, like the moral teachings that families and parents want to bring into kids that's on the parents that's on the family structure like this idea that you get to mold kids into being social justice activists for your social justice causes it's such an enormous overstep to me right like of course you're going to talk to kindergartners about being kind to each other of course you're going to want to talk about how to resolve incidents of bullying for you know adolescent kids and and there there are times where it's not all just reading writing maths right like there's times where it's where where social skills co appropriately come into a classroom but the the balance between teaching social studies teaching civics teaching history teaching chemistry to and teaching kids how to be social justice you know advocates and warriors and it's like excuse me, that's not your job, right? That's not appropriate for, for schools to have decided, right? When I went to high school, my teachers weren't deciding that they were going to teach me how to advocate in the world, right? Like I, it, it never, it never came up. It just wasn't, it wasn't what they saw their role as. And I don't think it really is the role, uh, certainly not of public school kids. If you want to send your kids to the private school of social justice, go for it. But public schools have an obligation to teach a wide, wide array of kids, including kids whose families come from enormously different religious and political and cultural backgrounds who 
don't agree and certainly shouldn't agree on what kids should be fighting for in the world. Right. Mm. So like when you mentioned, okay, it's not, doesn't look too bad in your kids' schools. Now, if a parent is still, like, I mean, again, this is, I think you mentioned, there's a lot of issues. Like there's a lot of moving parts here. So, yeah. um, you know, like I've been following uh, free range kids mm-hmm. and it's spoken with Lenar Skenazi as well. And like things like that. I mean, there was also, I think it was, I think it was Idaho was one of the States that passed a free range kids law and you know, where, you know, you're not going to get child protective services knocking on your door. If your kid goes to the park down the road, mm-hmm. you know, so like parents didn't have a lot of time. Like, you know, I agree with that. Like you know, you're constantly having to supervise everything they do. You can't let them do anything on their own. So parents, you know, I remember growing up, we'd leave on the weekend in the morning and come back at dinner time, and that you know that was pretty much it. So our parents had all day to do something, and you know they could figure stuff out. But now, like our parents, looking just looking at the curriculum, like just looking at the syllabus, going, okay, so you're going to be reading these books this year. You're going to be doing this and whatever. You're gonna, like you said, oh, talking about anti-racism, which sounds like a good thing. Blah blah blah. Like, or do you do parents actually get like a lesson plan and everything, or they just get a syllabus? Like I'm just, you know, because I know there was another state, I think it was North Carolina that made it mandatory that they had to show the lessons plan, at least from the previous year. Yeah, that's something that I think has been sort of interesting about COVID is parent is like transparency in the mm-hmm. classroom because all of a sudden you your kids are on a Zoom class and you're mm-hmm. hearing whether you want to or not, you're hearing other kids chat in the classroom, you're hearing the teachers, you're hearing the interactions. So yeah, I think it's funny you mentioned the free range kids thing because it just highlights the fact that we have the sort of helicopter parents who, who program a kid to within an inch of their life. And so they know what's going on with them every second. And then you have kids that have a tremendous amount of freedom in New York City from a very young age, kids wind up on the subway by themselves or with friends to go to and from school. So it speaks to what I'm saying about there's this enormous diversity of parenting styles and of what parents expect of their children, of what they, and so schools should be a place where this wide, wide array of families, of parenting styles, of kids should be able to go and get their education. The idea that the schools are molding children into these activists and into, into kids who will promote an ideology, right? Because let's face it, just like on, University campuses, there's so little diversity viewpoint. There's this enormous um, left-leaning perspective and very few conservative, you know, professors and, and or folks who self-identify as conservatives. There might be more conservatives on campus, um, but not that many that want to stick their head above the, you know, the ramparts and say they're conservative. Um, but I think you get that. I know you get that. The, the vast majority of teachers and administrators in, in New York City public schools are left leaning um, people politically. Um, and so when you've suddenly taken on for yourself this role of training kids to be advocates and, and uh, you're, you're training them to advocate for positions you agree with. Right. Even if you don't say it explicitly. Right. But you don't you never walk into a New York City public school. I, it'd be really hard to find a New York City public classroom where you walk in and have a robust discussion that gave pros and cons about President Trump, right? Like let's talk about the last president of the United States and talk about what he did right and what he did wrong. You're never gonna hear that conversation in New York City public schools. It's just sort of more about, you know, how can we fight climate change? How can we be more anti-racist? How can we, um, you know, address the intersectional horrors that we all face every day. You know, this, this notion, it, it's really a, a left leaning ideology. And even if you agree with it, and there are, pro- I've always considered myself a person of the left and there are things that I agree with from a left perspective, but it's not appropriate to expect everyone's child to go in and have that stuff force fed to them. Yeah. I mean, okay. The left leaning and stuff like that, but the, for, for me, it's like something you kind of hit on, like what's coming out of colleges and, you know, when you mentioned, so, I mean, these teachers are coming from somewhere, I mean, it's not like, you know, like you're just picking people randomly off the street. So it's, right. you know, you look at the colleges of education and you look at actually what happened on universities. And, you know, if, if you read like people like Jonathan Haidt and stuff like that, you know, like mm-hmm. this started seeping out around 2013, 2014, it started coming off campus a little bit. Mm-hmm. I mean, I, I place it earlier. I place it like at the end of the nineties, um, 
mid to late nineties is when this stuff slowly started making into administrations and policy. And I mean, I feel a little vindicated because I heard John McWhorter say something like, like that too. He goes like, we need to get back to like a 1997 mindset or something. He said something like that. So I was like, okay, I feel a little vindicated about that. But um, now, I mean, you lost your job. I mean, I'm kind of pissed off at all the people who said, okay, you know, the excesses of the left were one of the things that helped get Trump elected. But then it was all Trump all the time. And no one really... Like no one did anything about what was going on. So, I mean, like, like how upset are you at, like, uh, at academia? Like, at people who are, you know, professors with tenure who are basically, like, you know, fireproof, who are afraid to speak out about this stuff, who are not, okay. I mean, like, you know, the, they're putting the onus on, okay, and I get it, parents, it's your kids, it's, you know, you should take some responsibility, but I'm, I'm assuming some university professors have kids. Like, you know, aren't they worried about their kids? Aren't they, wor- right. like, you know, like I said, on my personal end, I'm like, you guys just dropped the ball. Like you had right. four years to you know, let the New York Times and Washington Post and whatever just rant about Trump 24-7, but you guys could have done something and they didn't. Right. I went to college and law school in the 90s. And so, and I think what we, what the, you mentioned wrong think, mm-hmm. like what we called it then was political correctness, right? <laughs> it's kind of the precursor to, it's like, that you rolled your eyes at the excesses of political correctness at the time, um, or some didn't roll their eyes. Some were like, give me more. <laughs> but some, some of us were rolling our eyes. Um, and unchecked, right, that has ballooned into the things that Jonathan Haidt writes about, about safetyism and about the idea that merely being exposed to words you disagree with makes you unsafe in some way. Um, that words are violence, which is clearly not. And it's, it, it goes against the very true American concepts of freedom of speech. Like words are not violent. You can dislike them. You can be scared of things you hear. You can be nervous about things you hear, but like free speech is, I know, cause I've seen you on other podcasts. <laughs> I know that you're certainly a free speech advocate, but that to me is like super worrying. It's enormously worrying to see almost like a generation of kids kind of like being unimpressed by free speech rights and being more interested in the idea of purging their environments of wrong think and of wrong speak. Um, And so, yeah, so for me with my, um, you know, I'm suing my former employer right now and and I'm doing so because I don't think, you know, you should have to, nobody in any job in any place should have to agree to only say the points of view and the words that their employer um, dictates or demands of them in order to keep their job. Yeah. I mean, it's like I said, it's just, the, especially like you're in the legal profession. And I mean, I, I mean, I, 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 maybe I can pick on that a little bit, but it's just, you know, this stuff started out of law school. So I'm just kind of like, you know, it's like, so how, how was that? How was that like where you worked? I mean, or, cause I know about some of the, like the, like the law societies in Canada and um, not, they're not necessarily bars, but they're something similar. And, you know, they were getting extremely quote unquote woke. Um, so like, how is that at your work? Like, you know, I, I'll say, I know in some ways, I think my law office, although public defenders mm-hmm. in general, because I worked as a public defender are tend to be a very left leaning bunch. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't think the office is all that different from many, many, offices because um, you have, uh, there's diversity of opinion and there are the, a diversity of political viewpoints, but then you have um, a contingent, right? That's super woke and that's super loud and that's, that feels no repercussions, can't even imagine a repercussion for speaking their points of view and everyone else is quiet. The occasional pushback here and there, but most people, if you don't have the most left-leaning thoughts and approach, you keep quiet. <laughs> and then, um, I don't know, when I first started working in the office, it'd be more robust debate about certain issues. Um, we're, we're New Yorkers. The, it, Israel and Palestine comes up endlessly on, on work emails, bizarrely, because we're not an international think tank. We're <laughs> right. It's a, it's, um, but you would have people arguing about these things. But what I saw, you know, over the course of the time I worked in my office was, those who were speaking up got to be a smaller and narrower band of, of, you know, ideology. 
and everyone else just, it became too risky, too bothersome, too, too worrisome to speak up. And that silencing is a real problem. I don't think it's unique to law offices that you mentioned professors mm -hmm. on campus. There's tons of professors who will say privately, um, I have to be careful about what I say in a seminar. I have to, you know, moderate what I say. And, and even in my, you know, in a, in a classroom and there's nothing good about that. I mean, you want people to be, of course, people should be thoughtful when they're speaking in a class. You should be respectful of people. You should be, but you should also, ideally, if you're a professor in a university, be thought provoking and be challenging students' ideas and helping them to broaden the way they think about things. Yeah, I mean, you, you should be able to read uh, letters from a Birmingham Jill without worrying about getting fired for saying yes. the N-word when you're, you know, I mean, no, but honestly, like, like when it's come to that point where a professor can't read that book because, you know, he or she is white mm -hmm. and they can't read it to college students, I'd be like, okay, you know, that's like, getting back to like height and like, well, the, the book he wrote with Greg Lukianoff, like the coddling of the American mommy, like, like you've coddled a generation and it's, you know, and I, I pick fun at it. Oh, well, they're the generation of everyone got a trophy, but it's like, okay, to some respect, you can't put that on the kids. You know, right. you really can't. I mean, it was. If you, you know, raise a generation to believe these beliefs and then yeah. they turn around and believe them. <laughs> But no, I mean, not only that, it's just like, you know, everyone gets a trophy. Everyone has to feel good. Everyone, it's, it, it's like you didn't prepare them for loss or you didn't prepare them that, you know, like, yeah, okay, you didn't get the job you wanted. It's not the end of the world. And your first thought shouldn't be racism, sexism, homophobia, you know, right. the whole gamut of things, right? Like it's, right. so, I mean, that's where I'm, again, when I getting back to like the, the colleges and stuff, I'm okay. It's, it was bad enough when it was in the colleges. It was bad enough when the people being trained to do some of the stuff are learning this and that's how they're being formed. But now if you started from K through 12, I mean, they're already primed when they get to college. Like they're primed to think that way. It's not like they, you have to re have to make kids relearn how they think and to think in a new manner because I mean, you've done it for them. Mm. Yeah, I think for me as a parent watching my eldest boy is a teenager, he's 15 and my youngest is five. So I've got a 10 year spread of watching how kindergarten looks different from 10 years ago. Um, and and the way in which the ideas that, that people have rightly worried about in, in university um, have worked their way into K through 12 education. Um, I think that's why we're seeing the sort of explosion of parent response to it, right? Because you see the, all these school board meetings going viral with parents freaking out because what's going on in K through 12 education is really troubling. Just kind of sticking with this because um, you'd mentioned an article you'd done in uh, when we were talking earlier in Newsweek about um, like the transgender stuff. And I know a lot of focus has been done on like critical race theory based curriculum, but I mean, it's, it's, it's not just that, like there's the trans stuff. There's, you know, there's a whole gamut of things. Like even when you talk about environment, there's, you know, climate justice, right. You know, mm -hmm. people of color face worse issues with climate change than, than white people. It's like, okay, well, if you fix climate change, you'll help more people of color. It's, it's you know, right. like they, 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 right. so I mean, it, it permeates everything. So, would you mind getting into a bit of that? Like, like some of the gender stuff and things that you're seeing or the what gender stuff is, is out of control, right? Like the, I seeing the ACLU, an organization that I used to have an enormous amount of respect for put out a Ruth Bader Ginsburg quote about <laughs> women and take the word <laughs> women out of it. It's a, it, it, I, I've had again and again that feeling of like, is it the onion or is it reality? <laughs> like, it's hard to know. I sometimes read posts and I'm like, wait, is this satire or is this real? Like what, what you have to sometimes, it, it's not always so clear. And that was a perfect example, right? Like the champion of women's rights in this country on the Supreme Court for so many years, um, the woman who did so much to advance women's rights legally in this country, um, having the word women excised from her quote 
by an organization that's supposed to be the defender of free speech. It's like, ugh, it was gross on a lot of levels, but it also just, it's like, thank you for showing me exactly who you are. And the ACLU has been doing that, right? They're like, this is who we are. And I'm not liking it. <laughs> yeah, okay, but I mean, it's, but this thing's permeated everything. It's okay. okay, okay, the Lancet, whatever, I mean, the Lancet lost a lot of reputability back in the mid nineties with the whole autism thing, you know, aut- vaccines cause autism, but the headline was it two or three days ago? Uh, they referred to women as bodies with vaginas, which was like, okay, this is a medical publication. Mm-hmm. And so it's very dehumanizing and demeaning language. And so the idea, right, is that it's being offered to be inclusive of trans people. And again, you know, of course we should be inclusive of trans people. Like, of course, trans people should be treated with dignity and kindness and not be discriminated against. I mean, that's a given, right? Um, But in what planet do you have to refer to me in demeaning and ugly and rude ways and in ways in which I don't consent to um, in order to be inclusive of other people? Like the idea that, that, the only time you're going to use the word women if you're the ACLU is when you say trans women are women. <laughs> like, where does that leave me? Why can't we <laughs> use the word women to talk about 50% of the planet, right? Yeah, but it's, I mean, to, for me, it's just, okay, like the dehumanizing language, they do it with race as well. Like you can see them saying, you'll hear a lot of things of like, okay, we need the white bodies in the back and we get, you know, black bodies up front and it, mm-hmm it's almost like they it's like some of the training with military they train you to dehumanize your enemy especially if you're going to combat and mm-hmm. because it's it's easier to i guess shoot someone if you don't think of them as completely human but it's okay now obviously like i'm going old you know taking this a little far but when they when you can't continuously just speak of people as bodies right it's not a human being anymore it's just you know, this thing and it's just it's you know, always like, been an odd choice of language for the progressive left right to say mm-hmm. like this does harm to black and brown bodies like why do you use bodies in that context instead of people right yep. instead of students instead of parents instead of whatever mm-hmm. group of people you're talking about um yeah i've always i've always found that to be odd there's a certain there's a lingo right a progressive mm-hmm. left lingo and and the use of bodies is part of it and then when you you know, move into the gender conversation, it is really dehumanizing to refer to people by genitals. I mean, it's, it's dehumanizing. It's yeah. also kind of gross. Yeah. I mean, okay. You know, that was thinking back to high school, which I have to go back quite a ways now, but I mean, you know, like, you know, whatever, um, like sex ed class and things like that, you know, they, I remember some of the teachers like, okay, you know, you know, especially the boys, like if you're, you know, stealing penthouses and playboys or whatever, um, you know, it's, you have to get past that a woman is just the sum of like, you know, like some anatomical parts. Mm-hmm. It's, and, okay. but now you're going back to it. It's, mm-hmm. it's the same thing with, okay. Like the, with trans kids. I mean, there's a huge issue up here in Canada and it's going to get worse, but um, where, you know, they're like, okay, you have to affirm the kids, you have to affirm this. It's like, okay, well, I, I read something recently. It was just, oh, my my little girl was two years old and she wanted a short haircut and I knew she was a boy at that point and that's how she was expressing her gender identity. I mean, it's like, okay, you know, we got past that. We got past where if a little girl wants to play with a truck, that means she's a boy. It's like, no, it's right. a little girl who plays with a truck. Like, it's very regressive. Some of the, like, yeah. straight-jacketed gender roles that people are assigning are it, it's very, very regressive. Like, um, And I wrote about, I'll say, you, you mentioned affirming therapy. Mm-hmm. It is so troubling and so wrong and it um you know for young kids or people of any age who have gender dysphoria the idea that a therapist's role is to simply affirm whatever your issue or concern or problem is coming into the office we don't do that for any other kind of medical treatment or doctor's treatment or or psychiatry treatment you know of of psychological treatments like you don't just say like oh yes this is what, you, you know, this is right. You're telling, yes, I agree with you 100%. We'll do whatever you say. In every other um, doctor's visit that you you go into, 
um, the doctor gets a say, the doctor gets to make a diagnosis. The doctor may agree with you, may not agree with you, may talk to you about things that you didn't know because you are not the doctor or the therapist. Affirming therapy is what, it's another one of those um, strange words. I mean, affirming sounds nice. It sounds like a warm hug, right? It sounds yeah. like something nice, but what it really is, is an abandonment of the obligation to really bring your knowledge and your expertise to help someone who's suffering. Yeah. I mean, again, I don't know how bad it is in some of the schools and like I, like I said, in Canada, it's getting fairly bad. I mean, it's, there's a case going on right now where uh, parents are suing their school in Ottawa because it was a little kindergarten girl and the teacher put up a spectrum on the wall or on a board or something and said, pick where you are on the spectrum. And the little girl walked up and she put herself all the way as female. And the, the teacher basically berated her and said, no, there's no such thing. You can't be all the way female. There's no such thing, blah, 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 blah. And it's just like, okay, but you're asking her to choose and you're telling people that their identity is what they want and this and that. And like, you know, again, I agree with you. Like you can respect people, this and that, you know, treat them fairly and treat them decently. But a kid in kindergarten to talk about like a gender identity. I mean, I don't think, I mean, they're not aware of it. It's it's ridiculous. You know, know, it doesn't belong. That doesn't, that doesn't, the pre I'm not familiar with that case at all, but any that the response of the teacher, if that's what happened is wrong, but the practice is wrong. Having kids put themselves on a jet, it's developmentally inappropriate, but it would also be inappropriate for, for 17 and 18 year old high school students, because one, it's none of your teacher's business, how you express your gender or your sexuality. Um, first of all, right. It's not really the place of a teacher to be, probing this or asking about this um and also sex is binary you're either a boy or your girl and your teacher knows if you're a boy or girl when you walk through the door so there's that yeah i mean like again it's i you know i understand gender like the whole idea of gender dysphoria and like you know i but if it's a young kid there's got to be some counseling there's you know like really find out what it is but you know, what's going on? What are the underlying issues? But I, I, again, up here, the, the parents, teachers can affirm the gender of the child. So if the, if the, if the child wants to transition, teachers can affirm it, teachers can support it, but they can keep the parents in the dark if they want. And I'm like, okay, that, at that point, you know, is now the school going to go get kids puberty blockers? Is yeah. the school now going to go get chest binders for little girls? Or Look, know, I uh, think sensible people and parents who are newly mm-hmm. um, awakening to what's going on and legislators who can be relied on to, to be, be sensible are playing catch up <laughs> with activists who have been promoting some really bad ideas. There's no good reason in the world um, to lock parents out of issues or concerns that are coming up about kids at school, whether it's gender dysphoria or anything else, unless you have like um, a documented, articulable, like really important reason to think that a, a parent doesn't have the child's best interest at heart. The first step you do when there's an issue or a concern of a kid at school is to bring in the parents. And anyone who does otherwise is, um, I mean, it, it should be illegal. Yeah. I mean, again, like I'm really worried about what's going to happen up here because a couple of years ago we had Bill C-16. So I think that was like 2016. And so it made it technically a hate crime to misgender someone. And that's what got in, um, you know, self ID and all that. But that's what if- I mean about playing catch up is that like, I was speaking to someone after I wrote the um, Newsweek article where I talked about some of this gender ideology stuff. um, I was in a conversation with someone, a trans person, a trans woman, and we were having this conversation. um, And they were asking me about sort of, because we we knew each other from another walk of life. um, And I said, you know, as parents actually, and I said like, look, the first time in in my country, in the US, the first time I, that, sort of trans issues and, and I, we didn't, we weren't talking about it by self ID, but we, 
we're, it was a bathroom issue. Like it, in North Carolina or South Carolina, it, it blew up as some issue about trans people using the bathroom of their choice. And really at the time I just thought, oh, this is some right wing wedge issue. Like who cares who's peeing in the stall next to you? Like it's not really a big issue, right? So what happens is, you know, if you are an open-minded, kind-hearted person, you think like, oh, stop trying, you know, it's the same way the right wing, the right wing of, of my country used gay marriage as a wedge issue in, in, in politics for, you know, that was an issue for a while. And now it's not an issue because, you know, I mean, there might be some people still opposed to gay marriage, but gay marriage has become so normalized so fast. And that's a good thing. Um, you make the first step, the first round of this in public about trans issues is like, well, it seemed like a right wing issue to me. It seemed like a, something that was grounded in sort of mean spiritedness. Like, of course, like who cares if a trans person uses your bathroom, but then all of a sudden that turns into convicted rapists in prison, going to prison and, and discovering that there are women in prison self IDing, And all of a sudden the laws have been laid out such that people, you know, men who are convicted rapists wind up being housed with women in a prison because they've self ID'd as a woman. And you're like, Oh, wait a second. When I, Back several years ago when I was saying stop being so transphobic and stop picking on these poor people who just want to use a bathroom that matches their identity. But now you see where, and then it, it becomes an issue with like misgendering people as hate speech, but then how do you help a child who's gender dysphoric find the right treatment for themselves? Like, you know, all of a sudden there's like this little web of, of rules and laws and, 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 things that, that you can trip up over and get wrong when you're just trying to be reasonable and to be, um, you know, truly non-judgmental for, for people who are trans and who want to live their life peacefully, you know, in, in peace yeah. and, in, in, and without ruffling anyone else's feathers. Something you'd mentioned there about the right wing. Now, like this is just me thinking back to some of the stuff. Like I remember, like you know, the like you said, the people, in the, you know, trans people going to washrooms, and you know, the gay marriage thing. And then there was always, oh, homosexuals are coming after your kids and all that. Like in the late eighties, early nineties, you had a lot right. of that too. I'm sure you had it before, but when I look at the the conversation around Islam, there was a point where you know people who were right wing, all the way up to like you know. Richard Spencer, alt-right, like that mentality, who actually took the time to read things like the Quran and the Hadith. And they were actually a little bit more well-versed in Islam than even, you know, the atheist movement, which is mainly left. And, you know, like some people in the atheist movement, I shouldn't say, you know. And so they would pick out stuff from the Quran. Like the, one example I always give is Robert Spencer, not Richard Spencer. Robert Spencer was, was an academic and he's part of like this thing called Jihad Watch or whatever. He started it. Um, I find him a little odious, but he's talked about this thing called taqiyya, which is a practice that Shia Muslims had. And technically it applies to all Muslims, but if you go into a hostile area, you can lie about your faith. So he, but it, it's, it is such a small little concept. It's a very niche concept in Islam. And like I said, it was mainly applied to Shias who were living in Sunni areas. Um, you know, I like, okay, I wasn't really a, you know, really devout or anything like that. Um, but I didn't hear about the term until 2015. Mm -hmm. So, you know, when I started reading a lot of this stuff and then I'm like reading like Judith Butler and Gail Rubin and, you know, and some of the stuff in the early nineties, I mean, they were pushing pedophilia. So like, I look back to some of the, like, just kind of looking back to some of these debates that had gone on in the nineties and stuff. And it's like, were there right wing people actually reading Judith Butler and Gail Rubin and some Foucault and saying, Oh, look, see the gays are coming after your kids, or this is going to be a slippery slope to going down. And again, I, I, I equate it with the, the talk around Islam. Cause there was like a lot of people like, Oh, well, you know, we can't talk bad about Islam because Islamophobia and the conversations we taken over by bad people. I'm like, by bad actors. I'm like, yeah, but you let that happen. You didn't actually go in and look at the claims because I think a lot of people were, trusting of the institutions not realizing how like how slowly they were becoming corrupted and they were just not paying attention and it's and again i see it happening now like there's like four years of trump not much was done and now it's got actual power and 
you know, people running around with their chicken, like chickens with their heads cut off. And it's like, and they're still complaining about, oh, this person's not speaking about it correctly. And it just, I'm like, then why don't you start speaking about it the way you want it to? Like, I, that's where I find a lot of this conversation. Like, like when you mentioned the right wing thing, it's, it's very similar to what happened with the talk around Islam. I think what I say is that you have to be able to speak simple truths out loud. Um, and whether it's around religion you know, which is certainly a subject that trips, trips people up a lot or around this, um, you know, sex, not gender conversation or whether it's around race. Um, we've all sort of learned what we're not supposed to say. And now as, and you're right, it, it, it gives a lot of runway to really bad ideas <laughs> and to really bad practices. And then all of a sudden you're left playing catch up to repair your public spaces, to, restore your faith in, in public schools and in universities and in, in institutions that I think, you know, the ACLU, when Donald Trump became the president in this country, the ACLU be, got a huge influx of money because people were like, oh no, what are we gonna do? We want a respected institution that we know will stand up for our rights, right? And so they got this huge amount of money. And now I think, oh my goodness, they've gone off the rails. Like I don't, you know, we've got, People like um, Chase uh, Strangio, yeah. I don't know how you pronounce um, that person's name, but like you've got, uh, you know, a, a, a senior person in the ACLU saying like, um, let's burn this book referring to Abigail Schreier's right. book, right? So it's like, wait a second, this is the ACLU, right? <laughs> and you're talking about book burning. Um, so I think there's, yeah, there's a lot of... Um, concern about what you're allowed to say, like speaking simple truths out loud um, and you need to do it. And around, um, you know, around multiple issues, it's all sort of coming together at the same time. Yeah. Now, like, how do you see a way forward out of this? Because like, I, I like, you know, you mentioned before, like there's a lot of moving parts of this. It's not just like, Oh, fix this curriculum and then everything's going to be fine. I mean, there's a, you know, like, what do you see, like, what do you hope will happen to kind of get out of this current situation? You know, it depends on, <laughs> <laughs> depends on what I've just read online, because I'm either feeling very hopeful um, or not, you know, and I, you know, there was just an incident, I don't know if you saw it online, where this, there was some exchange between dog walkers in Brooklyn, oh, yeah. and there was this guy who, like, it's absurd that it is a black man and a white woman and the white woman lost her job in like less than 24 hours. Um, really hard to know what the heck happened between the two of them. Cause very little of it is on, is on film, but it is abundantly clear that this guy, this man, this grown adult man was just dying to get a person. And in this case, a white woman. And that was probably his intended target canceled and you know fired from her job over her racism because he's if you look through someone was posting articles about his twitter feed it's like he lives for this stuff like he wanted this so badly he went he probably went home happy as a clam that someone had done or said something that he thought was you know that was offensive or racist to him so that he could make his point but it's like wait someone else said on twitter um this poet this guy Massey is his last name, but I've, he said, um, oh, I don't want to mangle the quote, but it was sort of like, um, you know, basically about how, <laughs> how oppressed you are in order to get somebody fired from their job in less than 24 hours for offending your, you know, your yeah. point of view. I've totally mangled the quote. He said it very concisely, but, but it's true. It's like you have, you're asking people to believe two things at the same time that you're a deeply oppressed person, but also you can get someone fired in less than 24 hours by posting a, on something on social media. That's not oppressed. That's enormously powerful. And it's, and it's wielding that power. And actually Nicole Hannah Jones of the New York times said like, eh, this doesn't seem right. And it's like, wait a second. If you, if you've tripped, if you've gotten Nicole Hannah Jones to tell you you're on the wrong side of things, when you're crying about racism, um, you've gone too far. And I, so when I see that, when I see that response, the enormous amount of pushback, I think, well, maybe people are waking up to some of this injustice and some of the, the excesses of cancel culture. But on the other hand, that all came, that all happened in the same week that the ACLU was 
doctoring Ruth Bader Ginsburg's quotes to eliminate the word women in England. They can't figure out who has a cervix and who doesn't, which is a very simple <laughs> yeah, yeah. thing to understand, right? <laughs> so I'm, and these are like the leaders of the country. These are the politicians. It's not hard to understand basic anatomy. So some, I'm, I get torn. I think like people are losing their mind and, and losing it more. And then I think people are starting to push back on these excesses. And I certainly, you know, yeah. my own little effort is to push back. But I mean, one of the things, like that case you're talking about, that guy, yeah, okay, if you look at his history and stuff, he reminds me, and it, it's a little bit more sinister, but he reminds me, of, like, there, there's two aspects of it. There's the one of, if you look at any authoritarian system or totalitarian system, people were afraid of their neighbors, because if you, if someone had a grudge against you, they could report you for anything stupid, and, you know, you'd get, you'd be disappeared. Um, but at the same time, this guy reminds me of, like, you'd hear about all those little penny any you know con people who would go to a restaurant and pretend they got a stain on their shirt and get like whatever 50 <laughs> bucks from the right you know like just like that kind of grift mm -hmm. and i'm and i'm like like you know i know the term grift has been overused or whatever but i'm like it, it's what that kind of is i mean yeah we don't yeah. know what happened between him and the woman before that video and that video is like right. you know after the fact and like even that's like a grainy little video it just um but yeah, I mean, like we've put ourselves what? at the mercy of like sociopaths. Right. You so you say grift, but like part of me thinks like um, if you choose your words carefully. But like um, as I was reading about it, I just thought like you know, man up a little bit. You're a New Yorker. Like you had a you had a rude interchange with a woman who's like looks like she came up to here on you, and like you jawed at each other over something like it's New York city. Like people will, you know, exchange some mean words sometimes. Like who told you you were going to go through life without someone, particularly like a relatively small woman, like being pissed off at you. Sometimes you think the remedy for that is to make the person lose their job as you cry about racism that you're not experiencing in that moment. He's a black man. He may well have experienced real racism in life, but a woman who's walking her dog being annoyed at him for something, maybe a reasonable thing, maybe an unreasonable thing. That's not racism. That's just regular life. I walk down the street and have, you know, I have lovely, pleasant inter interactions with my fellow New Yorkers and sometimes they have unpleasant ones. That's it. There isn't some big giant remedy you have when you have an argument with somebody. Yeah. You, you park your car with somewhere and some, annoy somebody, double parking, you know. Yeah. There's all sorts of issues that New Yorkers fight about. Like grow up. Like who, th who, who, why do you think that this is some issue that needs to be resolved publicly in social media with this person being, it, you were two New Yorkers, but a fight. You yeah. really knew how to fight. You had an argument, you had a, like a verbal altercation. Get over it. <laughs> yeah, seriously. But I mean, also it's, you get, and again, this is why I'm worried about K through 12 and with kids, like you made victimhood a currency. Mm -hmm. And so anything you can do to gain status points. Right. And so, you know, he's making himself a victim and he's going to get whatever more followers and more views and this and that, and, you know, up his brand or something, but like, I hope he's a tipping point though, because I think a lot of people were staggeringly unconvinced and that company that fired that woman, <laughs> I think they have like the companies who cave so quickly to ridiculous things like that, like they should start to pay a price. It should be more problematic to have fired somebody over some BS accusation of racism than it should be to, you know, just say like, you know, thanks for alerting us. We'll look into it. And if you look into it and you're like, this is nonsense, just keep like, keep employing the person and get on with things. Exactly. I mean, okay. But you know, when you say this was a tipping point, but it's, Oh, I said, I hope it yeah, is. Yeah, 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 no, no, I, I get that. But I, I look back at just even like a couple of years ago, the power of one person with, okay, it was a blue check on Twitter. And I don't think they had, you know, like 60 some odd thousand followers, something like that. I, I can't remember exactly, but it wasn't like, you know, a giant account like Joe Rogan mm -hmm. or someone. But Macy's had put out those stupid plates, which I didn't even find funny. But at the same point, someone wants to buy and buy them. You know, like it said in the center, it had a little circle. It said skinny jeans and it said like regular jeans and mom jeans. And then like, so 
Yeah, I'm I mean, familiar they, they, with this controversy. Okay, this was a couple of years ago, like I said. So Macy's came out with these silly little plates, so you could have like portion control type of thing, right? Oh. And so, some blue check mark on Twitter right. called it fat shaming and fat phobic yeah. and blah 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 blah. It got Macy's to pull the plates. Mm-hmm. Now, this is like one person on Twitter. Okay, granted, like I said, you know, sixty some odd thousand followers, but right. we. It was one person complaining about Abigail Schreier's book that got Target to take it off the shelves. And then it made it back on to their credit. But sometimes it takes one person because the the corporate world has been so trained to not want to, to mess up, but they have to retrain themselves to realize that like letting one, you know, uninformed person or one anti-free speech person, like yank your chain is not a smart, is not smart corporate governance. You need to have some principles and you need to stick with them. (laughs) <laughs> um, I don't want to keep it too, too much longer, but like, I know you said, like, I don't know, I mentioned you're running for city council. So what are your hopes for that? I mean, like, are you like, do you think you would have a, like, if you get in, do you think you'd have a chance to push back on like some of the education stuff or some of the policies that are coming out? Or? Well, it, I'm running as an independent, as you mentioned, mm-hmm. and it's in lower Manhattan. It's a city council district. Um, and yeah, I think, it, I mean, I would be one among many uh, city council members Um but yes, I think it would certainly be um, people would pay attention because we, I live in a very blue city and a very blue district. Um, I, I mean, I myself am a registered Democrat and always have been. Um, but running as an independent, you know, there are a lot of people I talk to and a lot of people I bump into who are deeply frustrated with both parties and with the sort of polarized nature of the conversation around these important issues. And, um, you know, it's my job right now to kind of like to try to talk to every possible voter out there, which I'll never do, but I'm trying, I'm out in the streets, I'm talking to people and I'm, I'm having conversations with people because when I talk to folks that I am not, um, there are a lot of people that share the exact same concerns that you and I have just spent an hour talking about. There are a lot of people out there who are worried about the direction things are headed. Are you, are you hoping more parents get involved with school boards now or like, you know, like even we as- have a super, I'm part of an organization in New York city called place NYC. Okay. Um, and it is a founded by a group of parents who are concerned about the quality of education in New York city. And um, our ranks are growing like all the time. We have a Facebook page and we have, um, you know, other social media mm-hmm. channels. We're on WeChat and we're on, you know, we have, um, a lot of parents are sort of waking up to what's going on in the schools. And, it, but, you know, I'm sympathetic to the fact that um, parents shouldn't have to, it's not our full-time job. We have, you know, um, you know, parents shouldn't have to restructure their school system. There are people who are paid to teach in our schools and run our schools and do it. And it feels like sometimes it feels like a full-time job to, um, you know, to get our schools in good shape yeah yeah, i get that like it shouldn't fall on the parents again like i I look at this and i'm like okay there's so many things a you have to i want this stuff stopped and what i say look, people are like okay because i'm a free speech advocate but in the same way i don't want you know islam or judaism or christianity forming the curriculum i i happy to have a religion class where you talk about comparative religion and so as kids get older if you want to discuss what these philosophies are with like juniors and seniors in high school when they might be able to comprehend it a little bit better mm-hmm. than like, you know, kid in grade five. Um, yeah. Yeah. That, that should be allowed, but I don't want this stuff forming the curriculum, but at the same point, if you don't fix the colleges of education and all the teachers coming out are thinking this way, it's, it's just a war of attrition at that point. Right. Mm-hmm. You mentioned John McWhorter before, and he is somebody who does talk about woke beliefs as a religion. Mm-hmm. Um I think it's a super helpful way to think about it because it's like, you may be right, you may be wrong, but it's your belief system, right? So you can believe in it as much as you want, um, but you can't make other people believe in it, right? In, 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 in my country, we call it separation of church and state, right? And you, um, yeah. you, know, you should be able to go into public institutions and not have to hear about other people's religion and certainly not have to bend your knee to other people's religion.
100%. Like I said, I don't want to keep you too much longer. Thank you very much for coming on. If you want to let people know where they can get a hold of you, um, I'll put the links to your articles and um, I'll put the link to Place New York in the description. Yeah, absolutely. Well, first of all, thank you. This was a wonderful conversation and it, it took us a little while to schedule it. So um, thanks for that, for, for bearing with me. Um, I'm really easy to find because it's always my name. It's maudmarin.nyc to find out more about my campaign. And at Twitter, it's at maudmarin. So, um, you know, I, I go by my name and I put my words out there under my name. I'm very clear about where I stand on things. Yeah, uh, so do I, but I, that's just because I'm too unimaginative to come up with a different <laughs> <laughs> To come yeah. up with a good alias. <laughs> yeah. Well, Maude, well, thank you very much for coming on. It was great talking to you. Great to talk to you. Thanks so much. All right. And thanks, okay. everyone, for listening. I'll be back.